Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the past few videos, we've just been solving and solving and solving and solving PDEs. And I want to do that again in this one. But what I'd like to do now is solve Laplace's equation. So remember, that's the sum of second order derivatives equal to zero. These are equilibrium temperature distributions for the heat equation. But I want to do it not on a rectangle like the previous video, but on a disk. Okay? So even though my picture isn't perfect here, this should be a circle. And it's a circle of constant radius A. We are going to solve Laplace's equation. So Laplace operator of u is equal to zero on this disk. And in order to do this, because we're using a circular domain, we're going to put everything in polar coordinates, OK? So what we have is our Laplace equation, which if you remember, I gave you the polar expansion a few videos ago for the Laplacian. So again, I'm going to assume u is a function of r and theta here now, the polar variables in the plane. And here I get my polar coordinate Laplacian. So I get r uh, here, and then plus 1 over r squared partial squared u partial uh, theta squared. OK, so r and theta, these are my polar coordinates in the plane. r is the radial variable. Theta is the azimuthal variable. And in this case, my boundary condition, well, my boundary condition is going to be on the boundary of the disk. So this is going to be u of a comma theta. Remember, this is the radial component. So when the radius is equal to a, that means that we're on the boundary of the disk. This is just going to be some function of theta. And if you'll take a look at this for a second, you'll notice that there's a lot of boundary conditions missing. Right? So I only have one boundary condition. But if you just do a sort of mental tallying, maybe if you take uh, the previous examples or, or the previous you know, workflows that we've done here as an example, well, OK, I've got two derivatives in theta. That typically means you need two boundary conditions for the theta variables. And I've got two derivatives in R. That means I typically need two boundary conditions in the R variables. All I've given you so far is one. So the question is, what are the other boundary conditions? Well, here you can see that there's a 1 over R term and a 1 over R squared term. Now, these can produce singularities, right? If R is equal to 0, if you're at the center of this thing. So one way that we can add a sort of artificial boundary here is to impose this, that um, my solution is finite at infinity. Okay, So that's essentially saying that I'm not going to consider any sort of blow ups. And again, that kind of makes sense. right? If you're thinking about these as equilibrium temperature distributions, uh, you're not going to find a place where you have infinite positive or negative uh, temperature. That just sort of wouldn't make sense physically. And you can ask yourself, OK, that might take care of r equal to 0 and r equal to a. But what about theta? Well, theta is a periodic variable. It has to go around in a circle. So in this case, we're going to put periodic boundary conditions on theta. So essentially, we're going to use minus pi to pi for my, my circle here. Uh, and we're going to say that these are the same. Essentially, this is uh, similar to what we did with Laplace on a ring, except for now the ring is sort of filled in. So we're going to have periodic boundary conditions in theta. And again, that makes perfect sense. There shouldn't be any jumps if you go around in a circle here. Now, our weapon of choice going forward is separation of variables. It's really what we have at our disposal in order to work through these things. So let's do separation of variables. Now my two variables are r and theta. So I'm going to assume that my, my unknown u as a function of r and theta is a function of theta, I'll say phi of theta, times a function of r, I'll just call it g of r. OK? So I separated out the variables. And you've done this before. You know what happens. I'm just going to give you what the PDE now looks like. Again, it's, it's equal to 0. Essentially, I get uh, r over g and then times d dr r dg dr. That's this piece right here, just with the, uh, with the g coming with us. And then this is equal to minus 1 over phi. Um, 
the second derivative of phi with respect to theta squared. And again, because the entire left-hand side of this is a function of r, the entire right-hand side is a function of theta, this has to just be equal to a constant, which I'll call, oh, uh, sorry, we'll just call it lambda instead of negative lambda. And again, you can use negative lambda if you want, it's just that uh, I know how to make this simple because I've already done the problem. So, of course, the first one is the easiest to handle here. So, uh, sorry, the, the phase components, right? So I get essentially phi double prime is equal to minus lambda phi. Don't forget about the minus here. That's why I didn't bother putting one here. And we, we've already seen this. We have periodic boundary conditions, so we need this right here. We're going to also impose them in the derivative, so we want a smooth, not just a continuous transition, but a smooth transition. And again, taking a look at this, two derivatives in theta, two boundary conditions, okay? So it's just a sort of mental accounting. We've done this over and over and over again. We already know how to do this. This tells me that lambda is equal to uh, n pi over L squared, which in our case is just n squared because L is equal to pi. Remember, we usually do this from minus L to L. I just put this here so you can remind yourself how we did this on the ring, right? But essentially, this gives me a solution that's sines and cosines, right? So again, this should look very, very familiar to you uh, because it's basically what we did on the ring. So now I get n theta plus C2 sine of n theta, and this is for all n equal to 0, 1, 2, all the way up. So I'm including n equal to 0 here, which is just the constant solution, because if n is equal to 0, this drops out, this becomes a constant. Okay, I kind of breezed through that pretty quickly because I think that you've gotten good at that by now if you've followed me this far into the lecture series. So let's actually do the one that's more interesting. Let's do the r-dependent part. And for the r dependent part, r over g, and then uh, the derivative with respect to r of r dg dr is equal to uh, lambda, which is now equal to n squared. It's been pinned down, which in this case, let's write this whole thing out. So I'm going to expand out all of these derivatives, and I'm going to make everything nice and pretty. Essentially, after multiplying through by r squared, I get r squared. Uh, d squared g and then dr squared plus r dg dr minus n squared g is equal to zero. Now, maybe you haven't done ODEs in a while, but this is a very famous kind of ODE, one that I solved in my previous lecture series on ordinary differential equations. This is what's called an Euler differential equation. And the reason I know that is because the power on the independent variable is the same as the number of derivatives. Okay, r squared, two derivatives. r, one derivative. Uh, no power on r, no derivative. Okay, and essentially we know that solutions to these equations, they look like this. They look like r to some power p when n is equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. And similarly, they will include a logarithmic term. So they'll also look like g of r is equal to, uh, let's say, c1 plus c2 logarithm of r if n is equal to 0. Okay, so you might have to brush up on this might take a little bit of work. Uh, you might have to go back and, and learn about Euler ordinary differential equations. But again, really all I want to show you is that it can be done. Okay, If you know what you're doing, if you have experience with this, then you can solve these things. And really that's what I'm trying to get at here. In this case, we can actually solve for exactly for what P is. And this gives me two solutions. It gives me C1 R to the N plus C2 r to the minus n, and again, that's for n going up from 1. And now, what I would like to do 
is I'd like to take a look at some boundary conditions, okay? So I imposed periodicity here to get lambda. Let's impose this one right here. So when r is equal to zero, I have to remain bounded. That means that this can't be here, right? I can't have a one over r term. And it also means <coughs> that I can't have a logarithm term in here. So, Essentially, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a series expansion here in powers of R and cosine and sine terms, okay? So essentially, therefore, U of R comma theta is equal to, now here, let's do this, n greater than or equal to zero of a n r to the n cos of n theta. Now you'll notice here that I started counting from zero to account for the constant term, okay? So when n is equal to zero, cosine drops out, this becomes a one, and I get my constant that I needed. And then plus, now I put in the sine terms, and these ones start counting from one, bn r to the n sine of n theta. Okay, so again, sines and cosines, that gives me the periodicity around the disk, and then r to the n, that gives me the boundedness at the origin. But of course, you know that I'm not done, right? There's still another condition that needs to be added here. And the last condition is this boundary condition. So now what I need to do is apply boundary condition u of a comma theta is equal to f of theta, right? And in this case, if I put r equal to a, so the left-hand side becomes f of theta, the right-hand side becomes these infinite sums, and I get, uh, so maybe not my best choice of uh, variable here, a sub n, I apologize for that, I did not anticipate uh, this. But then plus the sum of n equal to 1, and then bn, a to the power of n, sine of n theta. And what you can see here is now it's going to become a series problem. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to project onto each one of these terms. So for example, if I want to get a naught, this is going to give me, well, this is just uh, 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of f of theta d theta, right? We know that the, the constant term comes from the average of your initial condition. Then we know that a sub n, in this case, we have 1 over pi, but now we've got this constant term that needs to be taken off. So I have pi a to the n integral from minus pi to pi of f of theta cos of n theta d theta. And the last one here is projecting onto the sine mode. Again, one over pi, a to the power of n. So you have to be careful. This has to come with us every time. It needs to be divided off so I can isolate for bn. Integral from minus pi to pi, uh, sorry, cosine uh, f, pardon me, f of theta, sine of n theta, d theta. And again, the ability to do this comes from the fact that I have orthogonality of cosines and sines with different modes. But really what I want to show you is it's mostly the same, right? But here I use the, uh, the radial or the polar expansion of the Laplacian in order to do separation of variables. If you tried to do this with just Cartesian coordinates, x and y, it's going to be an absolute nightmare, especially imposing this boundary condition, okay? So this made my life a lot easier. As you can probably guess, though, if you have more complex geometries, these kind of things don't work and things become very, very complicated very quickly. Okay, in the next video, I'm going to show you how this can be applied to understand fluid flow. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.